Nazis, uh, Ukraine, like uh, anti-Russia, denazification, demilitarization, uh, Ukraine as collectivist puppet, uh, terror against Donetsk people, it's, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, um, uh, we uh, remember um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Putin's speeches and one of them was on 21st of February before the full-scale war, another on the 24th of February. Uh, and um, here's the uh, word cloud. And uh, the uh, research problem is that actually um, this discourse, discourse legitimating a uh, war for a country starting a war, uh, of course, exists uh, a long time, and each authority starting a war need to justify it, to legitimate it, some way before their citizens. And this is a so-called rhetorical legitimation. As uh, Tel Van Leeuwen put it, there is a legal, so-called legal, formal, technical legitimation by law, and there is also a rhetorical uh, legitimation through language, through argument or other uh, ways, and in, it, it is fixed in the dominating discourse. And this discourse then is spread via mass media, of course, and so on and so forth. And our research question today is what is common and different? It's like a very, very beginning of so-called typological research, yes? Uh, what are typological uh, basic features of such a, a war legitimating uh, discourse? So, and that is why we had to focus on, uh, to narrow a little bit, I'll um, speak about it a bit later, the corpus of the text, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, in our case, it's uh, just Putin's, Putin's uh, speeches, uh, which of course incorporate all these narratives and then they were spread and they are spread through social media, mass media and so on. Um, the cases of the two Gulf Wars uh, started by the USA in Iraq were very, very well analyzed. Uh, the first one in 1991, the second in uh, 2003. And for example, um, Manuel Castles in his iconic book, Communication Power in 2009, wrote about it and wrote uh, about the um, different sources used by the political system of the US to frame how he called it, to frame the reason to go to war in Iraq, uh, using information and misinformation. And this framing influenced the public opinion of the American population. And the uh, war against or war on terror concept constructed a network of associations in the minds, which are actually frames like psychological settings, associations in the minds very, very deep and strong the minds of the public that activated feelings, emotions in the deepest layers of the brain. Here it was, of course, the fear of death. Uh, George Lakoff in his iconic book, Metaphor in War, in 1991 wrote a thesis, basic thesis, metaphors can kill. Uh, what, what we meant, he understood metaphors rather widely, uh, actually, and uh, he also spoke about cognitive science, and uh, he postulated that people think in terms of frames and metaphors, conceptual structures like those we have been describing. And the frames are like in the synopsis of our brains, physically present in the form of neural security. And when the facts don't fit the frames, the frames are kept and the facts ignored. Both Castles and Lakoff uh, wrote in their works about this phenomenon then Sometimes even information and facts do not help because people just, because these frames are very deep and based on emotions. And uh, people, uh, what does not fit, they ignore it, yeah? And according to lack of framing is the art of communicating uh, such that one's language activates particular unspoken ideas and associations. Uh, the focus here is typological comparison uh, of motions, frames, narratives, and communicative uh, instruments 
uh, used in the dominant discourses in the Bush administration, one case in the Kremlin, another case, and identifying ways of rhetorical uh, legitimation of war. Uh, and basic hypothesis is that behavioral and cognitive influence functions is realized through emotional influence. Each in, in its turn goes through framing, then realized through narratives, myths or stories well told to people. And these narratives are made up with the help of metaphors and other tricks, plus some manipulative techniques and so on, which we will look for. And we, in our analysis, will go in the opposite direction from the text, in our case, Putin's speeches, uh, to their impact on the public. Um, when Castells wrote about uh, uh, frames in this war on terror against Iraq, um, he spoke about frames and narratives and basic emotions that I based on. Uh, and he spoke about frame of self-defense, very important. The narrative was like Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, which didn't prove true later, as we know. And of course, the, the basic emotion was emotion of fear. Then there was another frame, frame of victory, <laughs> which was valid, until, of course, until first defeat. Uh, and uh, here there was, uh, for example, a, a narrative like video, how citizens are taken down, set them out, and so on, and emotions of enthusiasm and pride. Frame of liberation, narrative, the gift of democracy from US soldiers uh, given to rugby people, emotion of enthusiasm. Frame of self-defense, narrative Al-Qaeda, the second war, yeah, uh, has entered Iraq and Saddam is connected with Al-Qaeda. And this connection was also very dubious, yeah, actually, but they tried to find this connection. We are not fighting Saddam, there is a, uh, which is important, there is a, a crucial that there is some force behind Saddam, which will be a bit similar to our some of our narratives, yeah, Russian narratives. There is some force, it's not only about Saddam, it's about terrorism, yeah, and of course, emotion of uh, fear. And of course, fame of patriotism, we don't abandon, we don't give up our own people, that's like Nibrasen. Uh, narrative, we owe our guys uh, who shed blood for us, yeah, emotional fusions. Um, speaking about a variety of narratives, uh, we can uh, find um, some uh, interesting aspects concerning American official rhetoric. Of course, it uh, changed. It changed depending on external circumstances. For example, the sh there was a shift from self-defense frame to the liberation frame because there was a failure to discover a weapon of mass destruction. Um, common language, it's interesting that Bush uh, escaped mentioning, according to Costas, escaped mentioning war itself. He said, it's war on terror, not war. Yeah, it's, in our case, it's special war operation. You know? However, American rhetoric didn't differ significantly depending on target audience. It was technically, though not strategically, more structured discourse. And we'll see later on. At the same time, it didn't contain significant contradictions. Uh, it is possible to simultaneously rescue the US from a threat and bring liberation to the Iraqi people. No contradiction. After all, the source of stress and the enslavement of people was Saddam Hussein. Yeah, it was clear why he was called evil. And at the same time, such framing was and is still criticized by competing discourses which exist in democratic society, of course. Well, uh, if we compare the situations themselves, there are some similarities. Uh, war starting two years before elections, and of course difference. If we explain the elections, uh, they were legitimate, and in one case illegitimate, in another case. War unfolds out of order, prompt rhetorical, it requires prompt rhetorical response, and rhetoric comes from dominant discourse. Most important difference is, of course, presence of competing discourses in American um, public uh, uh, speech uh, and only resistance of the weak uh, in modern Russian uh, authoritarian situation. Yeah? 
Um, another difference, of course, important difference, of course, is that in the U.S. Iraqi case, confrontation with the, uh, there was a confrontation with a very different country, not close, and uh, there was greater realism in defining opponent as undemocratic, of course, versus confronting a cultural close culture in case of Russia and Ukraine. So there is little basis here for accusation of undemocracy. Undem uh, for Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so, and we uh, will compare the rhetoric in terms of techniques, metaphors, narratives, frames, and emotions. Speaking about the Kremlin frames, uh, uh, there are many of them actually, and it's important uh, that they often deal with um, uh, victory or uh, restoring justice, revenge, uh, liberating the world, frame of offense, uh, meaning be offended, yeah? uh, like um, resentment, maybe, yeah? Uh, protection of uh, innocent people. Also, we don't abandon our own people, of course. Uh, uh, frame of altruism and just war. And these um, frames are um, supported by certain narratives or stories, like um, self-defense frame, whether it is fear or enthusiasm, it concerns uh, the narrative that West attacked people. Uh, defense of the weak, uh, pride and sympathy, enthusiasm, nephews attacked Donbass. Donbass, we defended, we are defending the whole world. Frame of betrayal and resentment deals with narrative that the West, NATO, the USA, partly no, betrayed us. It's expanding to the East, but not only, yeah, some uh, breaking some treaties, etc. illegal Kievsky regime. Um, uh, coup, as Maidan was described here, yeah? coup d'etat, etc. Uh, restoration of justice and pride, and emotion of pride. We bring a more just world. Yeah, that's the uh, nar uh, narrative here. Uh, not unipolar American, but more just world. Uh, revenge, mm -hmm. anger. We are to them as they are to us. We revenge. Uh, then uh, we can speak about frame of rest restoration of unity. Uh, restoration of unity or rebuilding, yeah, uh, reunion, yeah, reunion of the nation, uh, Russian nation and territories. We and Ukrainians are one people. Uh, uh, frame, just sorry, frame of selfness selflessness or altruism. Uh, we, uh, that's uh, again controversial because here it is said we don't need additional territories, territories like yesterday in Valdai, for example, what in some periods before it was said we need additional territories. Yeah. Uh, narrative uh, frame of victory dealing with feelings of faith or hope, of course, concerns uh, victory and uh, the narrative of finishing the war which was started by others long ago, yeah, a war with uh, Nazism. Um, speaking about the Kremlin narratives, some time ago, uh, Anton Shahovtsov, University of Vienna, uh, published a work, uh, Matrix of Narratives how to understand and decipher Russian propaganda. In this work, he uh, identified four different sets of narratives for different audiences, Russia, Ukraine, the West, and the global South. And according to Shahovtsov, within each set, it sounds rather logical, <laughs> at least more logical yeah, than when it is like melting pot together. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and one more quote for today I would like to add concerns Alexander Semyonov from Amsterdam College, historian, who wrote about political, uh, the Kremlin political language, and he wrote about this euphemism, special military operation. 
uh, and he wrote that legitimation of war is framed through very hierarchical language, but it's of course a topic for wider discussion. But this very quote uh, seemed interesting for me. Uh, according to according to Semyonov, uh, these uh, language claims a certain role of an important power to regulate world process. We start this operation. Yeah, it's like police action in some other territory. And it means that this very territory, Ukraine, lacks subjectivity, agency. Yes, it's not uh, a subject. Yeah, it's not uh, something independent and different. Yeah. Um, if we speak about uh, narratives, frames and narratives, and uh, compare them, uh, we can say that in the Kremlin, um, uh, there, are, there are so called active um, narratives which deals, yeah, there are common frames for both cases. Of course, these are frames of self defense, liberation, protection of others, and victory. But in the Kremlin narratives, there are very important frames of resentment, betrayal, selfless restoration of justice, yeah, and revenge, a re restoration of unity, unity of the nation, of the country. And it's interesting that they're almost not present in the Kremlin narratives. Uh, Putin almost never speaks about the spilled blood of our boys, like it, it is very important in American discourse, of course. Here, there are little of it, only in the context of their so-called Wagnerovtsy. And here it is important because here there is a very important narrative of redemption of guilt. Yeah, um, It's like a biblical purge is kuplenie viny, is kuplenie grecha. Here Putin speaks that people who were in prison got a unique chance uh, for resurrection uh, yeah, by spilling blood for their native land, etc. Uh, in general, um, it's important there are a lot of emotional frames and narratives based on so-called resentiment, resentiment, resentment, this feeling, yeah, and uh, speaking about global narratives, uh, speaking about uh, that here, it, this said, uh, the Bush administration said, uh, used the global narratives as winning world terrorism, war, war on terror. The Kremlin used, like, ending the Second World War, yeah, we were winning uh, world Nazism, which is still alive, yeah, fight with Nazism. We are winners here and we, we will win, yeah. And here it is uh, crucial that Ukraine is not a subject, it is devoid of agency and activity. It is like victim puppet project battleground for other forces. Uh, metaphors, speaking about metaphors in a very general Lakofian meaning, judge Lakofian meaning, uh, we can say there are some common metaphors, very um, uh, well, uh, very often used like light and dark metaphors, building organism, negative metaphors of sport and theater. Um, and according to um, Lakoff, in US war on terror, that was a very important metaphor, state as a person. It's like personification actually, and maybe metonymy, because all Iraq actually was presented as one person, Saddam Hussein. And uh, also Kuwait uh, was um, uh, presented as a victim, of Iraq, of course, and there was a metaphor of rape of Kuwait, which was very effective in American society. Uh, in the contrary, uh, the Kremlin uses the family metaphor, Russians and Ukrainians are brotherly nations. Uh, and um, speaking, returning to the US two wars of terror, there was a difference in the second war where the feeling was not only one tyrant, but Al-Qaeda behind him. And it, uh, the victim was more, it was more like self-defense here, and the victim was also USA. Uh, and it was also revenge uh, for 9-11. And uh, it is interesting that in the Kremlin war, uh, there is a metaphor fairy tale also, like in American war. A uh, hero is Russia, of course, uh, and now we have a lot of float, so-called floating signifiers. It's hard 
uh, more hard, uh, it's much harder than in American discourse to identify a villain, yeah? Because uh, it's either complex, yeah? Uh, and it's not concrete, not one person, uh, though they, uh, it, it's important to make uh, absolute evil from, of course, Zelensky, they try, but it's impossible. Sometimes it's the West, now Nazis, Banderovs, terrorists, uh, Janta, uh, Kiev, Junta, the regime, but it's uh, vague, rather vague, actually. As to the victim, it's also not so uh, clear sometimes. Of course, Donbass people, uh, innocent people in Ukraine, sometimes Russian people, um, but it's also not so defined. Speaking about more general metaphors, here, um, as Lakoff writes about US war on terror, he writes about the rational actor metaphor. So it means that each nation acts in its interests and our enemies are uh, presented as absolutely rational. In my opinion, it's something that is absent in the Kremlin propaganda. And if we try to reconstruct any global metaphor like that, in my opinion, it's more like time machine in the past because uh, we spoke and we'll speak more about some metaphors and uh, Soviet style uh, language. And also this very replaying of the past, USSR, World War II, you know, sometimes even references to empire, to the past, uh, 1000 year history, history, the historical uh, articles by Putin and so on. Uh, oh, how to make it, uh, to make it seen. Sorry, it's a bit, uh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll try to read it now. <laughs> yeah, um, there are a lot of uh, tricks uh, and um, techniques, tactics, instruments uh, we could observe reading these Putin's uh, Kremlin speeches, such as repetitions, for example, three times repetitions, letting that tricolon and tricolon uh, for more emotional effect. Also labeling rhetorical questions, oppositions are or we others, historical analogous, emotional uh, evaluations uh, where opinion prevails over facts, and a lot of or common places called topi or topos, um, references to place and time. Uh, it can be Stalingrad or Kursk or um, some other places, reminding of World War II all the time. Um, uh, also, uh, a lot of hyperbole, synthesis. Uh, oppositions and a lot of so-called paraphrasing language, uh, close to sarcasm, a language using euphemisms, uh, non-direct uh, namings, dropping names, um, saying so-called, uh, questioning the basic nomination, the so-called world community, so-called human rights organizations, and so on. Uh, personification like long-suffering Donbass, Actually, here it's close uh, to Kuwait as a victim. Here it's Donbass as a victim. High vocabulary, high style. We are uh, undefined, also a bit vague, a bit uh, floating, signify who is we here. Reference sometimes is not so clear. Pejorative vocabulary. Flattery to the audience praising. Stylistic boring of World War II discourse. Like, of course, violation of all Grice postulates, of all uh, Grice maxims, boring leftist discourse, um, labeling, uh, and uh, lack of direct nomination of enemies. And what we would say from this very, very preliminary obs uh, obs observing of examples, uh, that uh, Anton Shachovtsov's hypothesis that uh, about the diversity of narratives as a consequences of um, different target audiences is not actually conf con uh, confirmed. We analyzed speeches for uh, for the Russians, for inner audience, yeah, um, but still saw very post in postmodernist style, very 
um, eclectic and non-logical, irrational com combinations of absolutely different narratives. And that's a change dependent on the framing tasks caused by specific context, not exactly, uh, not only tactical, but also strategic disorderness, haphazardness, uh, what we can see. For example, contradictory ideas. We are one nation, but they, uh, Ukrainians are fascists, Nazis, Banderovts, yeah? We are brothers, but there, are, there were bio weapons against Russians in Ukraine. Though we are uh, Ukrainians and Russians are one nation, how is it possible? Yeah, the West attacked us, or Ukraine attacked us. It also changes sometimes. We want unity of territories to save people, or we want to reorganize the world, or we don't need these new territories at all. And as a result of all this mess, is a mess uh, in emotions, rapid, rapid, very, very fast change of broadcasted emotions, yeah, like kaleidoscope. And the effect with the audience is also emotions, but different uh, emotions that were mentioned before. It's like fatigue, anxiety, apathy, maybe depression, yeah? And uh, it's absolute total lack of emotion, of enthusiasm and fear. Because there is no more energy for strong emotions, there is not enough trust because trust is destroyed by the rapid change of frames, uh, change of frames and change of narratives. <laughs> the rhetorical questions put by Yulia was if it's, it was all very well constructed and on purpose or it's chaotic, um, just uh, unthought of or uh, the, the reaction to the, the great moment, understanding of Close the feet, oh, I don't know. Well, it's still open questions. Well, now I guess we are open to questions and discussion and Yule, <laughs> we have time to react to all this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. you. I hear uh, my English is not so be the best English. So I, I can um, answer your question, questions. Yule, no, maybe in Russian, yeah. Да, окей, я могу по-русски, по-английски, я просто такой большой текст не смогу сейчас. Uh, большое спасибо, Анна и Юлия, за ваш доклад. Thank you so much for your very informative uh, and analytical uh, presentation. You, the, the picture you drew is uh, rich of colors and details and a very interesting conclusion you proposed. Uh, dear colleagues, um, you are welcome to ask your questions. Uh, please raise your hands uh, physically or <laughs> in uh, the Zoom windows. Um, keys Alt, Alt plus uh, Y. В сочетании клавиш Alt плюс Y поднимайте руки, задавайте вопросы, дорогие друзья. Пожалуйста. Uh, and Sorry. while uh, while my co colleagues uh, are thinking, uh, I um, may I ask you one simple question. Sure. Uh, it it seems to me that uh, uh, <clears throat> a core of official uh, official narratives, uh, Russian official narrative narratives, um, is um, some kind of masculinity. Because mm -hmm. all that uh, stories about uh, importance to be strong and brutal and unite and uh, rule and so on, so far. Um, what do you think about uh, the potential and uh, uh, of such uh, masculine narratives in Russian in Russian political discourse and? Uh, do you think that we, civil society, can resist? Can resist? Uh, can we resist uh, all that narratives in um, in a language uh, level? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Maybe Yulia, because I uh, talked too much, maybe you would like to answer yeah. first to give your version of answer. <laughs> I think, uh, we should not resist to this narrative. We mm -hmm. should. We should. Um, 
Um, Propose a counter narrative. <laughs> no? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to see people, mm -hmm. to see, not uh, to, to be an object of propaganda, but as a thinking man, thinking a uh, human, yes? And, and not a, a propaganda object. So, uh, so I think that propaganda, uh, that propaganda and counter propaganda is the same things. They uh, uh, may counter propaganda can, um, can be more um, uh, said, более качественные, more quality, more quality. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. it's, but uh, this not uh, can solve the problem because um, uh, the problem that people uh, people don't uh, think by their mind. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think so, I still think. And about masculinity, uh, yes, I, I can. I think yes, such elements exist yeah, in, in the discourse and are found popular. Yeah. Mm. On the other hand, yes, I agree that it's a question of alternative discourses and of free communication and agency, the yeah? participation of people as agents, not objects. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I see uh, I can see two questions, yes. Ага, да, спасибо. Uh, могу я попросить вас тогда uh, презентацию уже uh, uh -huh. свернуть, чтобы мы видели тех, кто спрашивает. Uh, и в порядке поднятия руки вот Виталий, потом Елена. Пожалуйста, Виталий. Здравствуйте, спасибо большое за доклад. Uh, вот вначале было сказано, да, очень интересная тема, вообще дискурсы, нарративы, и вот я тоже над этим всем делом думал, и uh, было, было сказано о том, что особенность этих дискурсов, что люди игнорируют некоторые факты, которые не сочетаются с внутренней логикой и устройством некоторого дискурса, uh, хотя мне кажется, что, возможно, даже не просто игнорирование происходит, а происходит некоторая переинтерпретация, такой некоторый перевод, на собственный язык, в рамках которого противоречие исчезает. И вот как особенность этого всего дискурса как раз и заключается в некоторой ее, его всеядности. Практически любая информация, любой контрпример, любое указание на противоречие сразу же обращается в какое-то оружие против тебя же самого. И, соответственно, мой вопрос в том, как вообще возможно, возможно, возможно некоторое установление диалога с подобного рода дискурсом. Uh, спасибо, да, вот. Как вообще возможна коммуникация uh -huh. э, что-то вот вроде бы того? Да? Uh -huh. well, 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 я well, бы не стала делить это на разные дискурсы. Это, это разные фреймы и разные нарративы. Я бы так, наверное, ввела бы нашу терминологию в этой истории, потому что мы немножко все-таки считаем, что есть доминирующий дискурс. Этот дискурс вот такой постмодернистского... Ну, вы правда, это всеядность, но эта всеядность связана с тем, что в нем а, а, вообще, ну, как бы он ситуативно привязан, и он внутри логичен, внутри как бы своего конкретного выражения. Когда сталкиваются uh -huh. два раза, они, а, как бы ты можешь, конечно, человеку а, как бы предъявить, что вот здесь логическая неувязка, как мы вот сейчас. Uh -huh. а, но здесь можно сразу придумать четвертый, пятый, шестой, десятый дискурс, потому что нет никакой, нет никакой стратегии, нет никакой логики, которая бы предзадана во всей этой истории. Да? Нет никакой, никакой цели и так далее, кроме одной. Это как бы какое-то риторическое сопровождение происходящему. У меня есть предположение все-таки, это все забалтывание так называемое. Да? То есть мы хотим а, получить... Это, текстов очень много. Да? Вот мы с Аней тут замучились, потому что мы просто начали смотреть э, Кремлин Ру, и мы просто, там, просто Путин фонтанирует текстами. Он то есть, не дает тебе просто продохнуть от этих тех, текстов. Это именно вот это вот ощущение того, что этого всего много, и, вот выступа... и цель — это усталость. Да? И мы по политическому действию 
Путина, тоже это видим, потому что они не хотят никаких энтузиастов специальной военной операции, их энтузиастов либо как бы вот то, что с Пригожем происходит, либо то, что с Гиркиным происходит. Нужны уставшие люди, которые ничего не хотят. Вот, поэтому как, если вы говорите, как противостоять насилию этого дискурса, правильно, дискурсу противостоять вообще невозможно, можно, на все, можно разговаривать, с дискурсом разговаривать нельзя, можно сказать, с носителем а этого дискурса, ну, то есть, или в данном случае не с носителем, потому что с носителем бесполезно разговаривать, а с потребителем, да, с тем, кто, кто в кого это влито, да, так скажем, с объектом этого дискурса, и с ним можно сказать только одинаково, можно полюбить, пожалеть, понять, и никак не, не надо ему что-то убеждать. Носители таких дискурсов невозможно убеждать, их надо избавить от этого страха и от этого апатии, и надо показать другие горизонты. Ну и просто разговор о войне в любой его... Как бы, это, ну, это мое личное мнение, они, может, сейчас как бы, меня перебьет и скажут, что сегодня так. Вот, но э, разговор, любой разговор как бы, о войне, он приводит только к невротизации человека, а человек не хочет об этом говорить. Поэтому надо предложить другую тему. И в моем представлении надо говорить о будущем, конечно, в мире войны. Спасибо, Юлия. Вот как раз в прошлый день, 4 числа у нас был доклад, где один из спикеров тоже профессиональный специалист по риторике, говорил, что мы можем наводить коммуникации с, совершенно, с, эм, с теми аудиториями, которые совершенно отличны от нас по мировоззрению, когда начинаем говорить с ними хотя бы на, для начала на нейтральные темы, а выстраивая прежде всего э, какое-то э, доверие, непосредственную коммуникацию, потом уже э, пытаясь их переубеждать, потому что вот это вот пробивать чужие убеждения при помощи каких-то аргументов подобных действительно в вопросах бывает неэффективно и даже бессмысленно. Uh -huh. а, но я не хотел вторгаться, я вижу у нас на очереди еще вопрос от Елены Черепанов. Елена, я еще, позвольте, я маленькую реплику просто добавлю, извините, пожалуйста, сейчас крошечную. Я соглашусь и добавлю просто, что вот теория вот этого фрейминга, мне кажется, очень продуктивная, действительно, потому что вот эти фреймы действительно затрагивают очень какие-то глубинные базовые эмоции. Я, и это не обязательно может быть, тут как бы так вот по кругу это идет, пропаганда, она ловит что-то, да? они, они соответственно навязывают это, но она и что-то ловит. То есть я знаю людей, которые говорят, и действительно я знаю, что так и есть, а я телевизор вообще не смотрю, или у меня его нет. Откуда-то вот у них это вылезает, вдруг из-под корки да, начинают вылезать эти, эти фреймы, эти вот, да, где-то это ловится, и главное, находит у них отклик внутри, где-то очень глубоко какой-то да. оби обиды или желание какой-то компенсации вот, 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 на каком-то Я... глубинном уровне отзывается. Угу. Логическую некоторую рамку, мы да. тут с вами вчера обсуждали как раз, у нас есть такое хилое место в этой, во всей нашей конструкции. Я думаю, сейчас нас поймают, поэтому лучше пока нас не поймали, мы сами признаемся. У нас, конечно, на уровне эмоций это интроспектические интроспекция, да, то есть мы занимаемся интроспекцией, у нас нет объективного данных. Поэтому вот в рамках всего того, что мы сейчас говорим, конечно, интересно было провести социолингвистический опрос относительно а, того, или глубинное интервью, или какой-то другой форме, это надо подумать, да, относительно вот этих эмоций а, или теста и так далее, и получить какие-то более объективные данные. Но мы, как здесь в данном случае, выступали как два носителя и проверяли друг на друге, вот, но, в принципе, конечно, это такое uh -huh. слабое место исследования, которое... И предполагаем продолжать и продолжать, потому что оно очень интересное. И в аспекте типологическом, прежде всего. Спасибо. Есть время, но очень короткое. Елена, пожалуйста, вам слово. Да, спасибо большое. Очень интересный доклад. И частично уже начали отвечать на мой вопрос. Мой вопрос э, был практически, почему и по какой причине, если у вас какие-то идеи, почему дискурсы пропаганды имеют так много сил, и почему нельзя просто создать э, альтернативные дискурсы, э, как, почему люди выбирают политический дискурс. Но мне кажется, что вы уже начали про это говорить немножко. Потому что если, если есть дискурс, может быть, любой человек может создать какой-то каунтер-дискурс, да? Ага. А почему это не происходит? Почему у них разная сила как бы влияния? Юль, у тебя нет звука? Ну, это мы сможем объяснить очень просто, по если мы пойдем любую чего... С точки зрения Мишеля Фуко, да, 
Решель Коп, считал, что вообще невозможно никакое дискус тоталин, никакое сопротивление невозможно. Да? Если мы берем более поздние теории, то там Лакла Муф, они считают, что все дискуссии вот как бы конкурентны. Вот это то, что вы сейчас да, пытаетесь сказать, ну, может, создать другое, будет конкурентно, но это не... Эту теорию я вот вижу, что она не подтверждается на практике. Есть теория критической дискус исследований, которая говорит о том, что да, есть более доминирующие дискуссии и конкурирующие дискуссии, которые более слабые, они зависят от ресурсов. То есть есть дискуссии, обладающие властью, властным ресурсом, а в данном случае это ресурс ну, как бы, доступности, да, телевизор, это ресурс а, слав, свободы этого дискурса, ты можешь про него этот, говорю, спокойно его высказывать, или тебя потом придут по башке, побьют, ну, вот, и так далее. То есть есть а, доминирующий, особенно в авторитарных режимах, даже в демократических, как мы видели с вами по американской истории, существуют доминирующие дискурсы и конкурирующие, но там гораздо меньше разница в ресурсах, да, и об авторитарных режимах у нас ресурсная, зависим, ресурсная разница, она очень сильная, очень большое ресурсное неравенство, и поэтому дискурсивное сопротивление, оно носит скорее такой эм, характер с надписью на заборе, а надписью на заборе uh -huh. очень тяжело довести какой-то сложный нарратив и сложный дискурс. Сложный... Спасибо. Вот к вопросу Спасибо. о соцопросах, да, потому что боятся люди отвечают, как мы знаем, они и отказываются, и тоже как это все проводить, да, это тоже сложно. Ну, к вопросу о надписях на заборе, меня очень сильно зацепило художественное высказывание ну, так, и художника по имени, по, по, по прозвищу Филиппензо, да, вот это израсилование. Вот одним словом, очень так вот сильно разрушаются и высвечиваются какие-то особенности фрейма э, риторики, используемых российскими властями. Э, спасибо, спасибо, друзья. Uh, thank you, Юлия. Thank you, Анна. Thank you so much. Thank you, friend, dear friends, for your questions. And it's time to uh, continue. I would thank like you. to thank you. I would like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Igor Pavlov. Uh, Igor is a psychologist uh, and a colleague of mine uh, at the Free University, Brive Universitate. And uh, Igor will deliver us a talk about um, AI language models and communication. Moment, just moment. 